we'll start with looking at the eight basic truths of fundraising. Um, and these are important for you to know and understand. Um, first of all, organizations must earn trust to get money. Your board of directors is in place to ensure the public's trust, and their primary responsibility in a nonprofit is uh, fiduciary responsibility. So you really want to have a well-formed and involved board in order to help gain that trust. You want to spend your money well and be transparent with your finances um, so that people trust your organization. Um, organizations that face any type of scandal in regards to um, executive compensation or uh, access benefit to anybody involved, those are the organizations that are really going to lose their entire donor base. So trust is definitely important. There's so many organizations out there to choose from for donors to give their charitable dollars to and you really want them to trust that your organization is a good choice. Um, secondly, organizations must plan and be prepared. Um, you just kind of can't fly by the seat of your pants in fundraising. Uh, you really need to plan in advance. Budgeting, you always want to be looking at next year, always looking ahead, um, and being responsive to your environment, uh, strategically managing your organization. So it's very important that a well thought out plan be prepared and implemented correctly in order for your fundraising campaign to be successful. Um, third, raising friends is a way of raising money. Uh, people give to people more than people really give to organizations. While your donors believe in your cause, and they believe in the work that you're doing to address that cause. Um, really, it's the same as it is in for-profit sales. Relationships build sales and relationships build um, donations in a nonprofit. So really, you want to get the word out there and make friends with as many people as you can in your community and make them really want to give to you and your organization. And that leads us in to number four, fundraising is selling. Um, it is relationship selling for nonprofits. You really need to cultivate your donors um, and build relationships with them so that they continue to make ongoing and hopefully growing donations to your nonprofit. Number five, uh, you must ask to receive. And this is probably one of the biggest obstacles that new organizations face. Um, especially those that have individuals involved that don't have any experience in development um, or fundraising, one of the most difficult things to get used to is making the ask. Um, don't feel like you're a beggar for making the ask. That's how nonprofits operate. The worst thing that can happen is somebody tells you no, and that's not the end of the world. You have to continue to make the ask and really Find your niche where you're comfortable and your intro. Um, get used to it. Practice um, because you're always throughout the life cycle of your organization going to be continually making the ask. And it's probably as you grow going to be um, asking for higher and higher amounts of dollars. Number six, it's important to ask for funding now, not later. You really don't want to wait until you're in desperate needs of fun to begin to start asking. Um, you want to do it on a continuous basis. Fundraising in all nonprofit organizations should be a continuous and ongoing effort. Seven, um, staff must get others to ask for money. I think it's important that everyone involved in your organization uh, be a member of the fundraising team. Not necessarily officially, but just to have the environment within your organization amongst your board, your staff, your volunteers, that this organization belongs to all of us. And I should be comfortable, and you should be comfortable, and everyone in the organization should be comfortable spreading the word about what you do and not being afraid um, to ask for money when you encounter the opportunities to do so. You may find that your staff members or your volunteers, while Fundraising is not one of their typical job responsibilities. 
you never know who they may encounter in their day-to-day -day lives. And so you want to have at least everybody prepared and comfortable with the fact that they, they are behind your organization, they're passionate about it, and given the right circumstance, everyone should be comfortable with saying, hey, you should give to us. And number eight, finally, donors are not harvested but nurtured, um, cultivated. You really need to develop strong relationships with their donors. You want to get to know about them and why they're interested in your cause and maybe where the inspiration for that interest came from. Did they have a family member um, that was a breast cancer survivor in your breast cancer organization? How can you relate what you're doing to them and their personal experiences? You want to always keep them up to date on what's going on with the organization. Send them stories of the people that you've helped. Um, your annual reports and newsletters. Invite them to events. You're always wanting to build and nurture that relationship with your donors. Um, you want to always find new donors, obviously, and extend, extend your donor base. But at the same time, um, you want to, the donors that you have, make sure that you retain them. And you'll retain them um, by properly nurturing them. So fundraising and a slow economy. Everyone realizes that over the last several years, our, our country has been in a recession. Um, and one of the first places that individuals begin to tighten up their belts when it comes to their budgets is in their charitable giving. And this has greatly affected nonprofits nationwide uh, with individual giving being down um, and corporate and foundation giving being down because their assets aren't returning as much on their investment as they have in the past. Organizations have really had to adjust to the new situation, the new economic climate. But it's important that you don't make the mistakes um, that too many organizations are doing during this time of recession. And those most common mistakes are spending less on fundraising. While it seems that when the budget is is down and the cash flow is slow, that fundraising expenses might be a good place to cut back because they are an administrative expense um, and you may want to cut back on them to allocate more money towards your programs. Um, that's really not a good decision because if you're spending less on your fundraising efforts, then you're bringing in less and all you're doing is creating a bigger hole for your organization, a larger deficit to have to um, bridge a gap on later. It's important not to become pessimistic. Uh, it's important to have a positive attitude that things will turn around and that all of the organizations will get through this tough time. Everyone seems to be saying that our country is in fact coming out of this recession and things are looking up. Um, 2009 definitely was a worse year than 2008 for charitable giving and for struggling nonprofits, but you just want to be optimistic, continue trudging along, Get creative with your efforts so that you can make it through this time and then again prosper. Don't apologize when you're asking for a donation. Um, you should present yourself in a fashion that the donor should be privileged to give to your organization. They should want to. It shouldn't be a burden on them to give. It should be something that makes them feel good because they know that they're helping other people and they're giving to an organization um, that's really cost effective and doing great things. So never apologize when you're making the ask. You really want to talk up the organization and make them feel like this is such a great opportunity for them personally to contribute to the efforts that your organization is making. And then finally, and probably the biggest mistake that um, organizations may be making in this slow economy is not maintaining their relationships. Organizations, when faced with budget deficits, may be scrambling to put together um, some creative ways to cut the budget or to generate additional revenue. And with the focus being on that, may lose their focus on their existing donors and fail to maintain those relationships. And if you don't take care of them, someone else will. It's the same with any type of customer service attitude that you would find in the commercial sector. Um, if 
if you don't take care of your customers, somebody else will, and that transfers right on over to nonprofit organizations. If you do not maintain quality relationships with your donors, another organization will come along and cultivate a better relationship, and they will transfer their charitable giving to that other organization. So let's talk about some do's. Um, you do want to make a compelling story. You want to make sure that you have a strong case for support, um, a compelling story about what your organization does. It's really important that you have that elevator speech ready, that two-minute snapshot of what you do and the difference that you're making in the lives of your constituents um, that you can narrow down to just a couple of minutes and yet do it in a way that you really are making a case that you want to be able to pull on someone's heartstrings and amaze them in just a couple of minutes with what you're doing because you never know who you're going to come across and you want to be ready to tell your story all the time because you never know who may end up being a major donor for you. Um, you'll want to recognize that recessions can ramp up the urgency levels in favor of your case. Um, specifically with social service organizations right now, um, the failing economy has led to a lot more individuals turning to social service and human service organizations than ever before. A lot of individuals and families that typically were not your low income or moderate income family that you would normally envision as needing the assistance of social services, a lot more of the middle class and upper class have fallen on hard times and it opens up a much larger um, constituent base for many social service organizations. So that can really help make your case at this point is to be able to demonstrate to a donor, I know economic times are hard and charitable giving is down and that you may not have as much to give, but look at how much more our services are needed now um, because of the recession. Have statistics available. Um, the worst case scenario statistic, I always the worse the statistic is, the better it is for making a case. And that sounds bad, but that's really true when it comes to fundraising, when it comes to grant writing and your problem statement. The worse picture I can paint, the better that is for the case I'm making for funding. You also want to remember that small gifts add up. Um, don't always be going after the big money man. Um, the large government grant, the wealthy individual, the big foundation award, um, because those are a lot more difficult to come across. You may find that your time and your efforts are a lot more well spent um, generating small donations from everyday people than from going after those huge amounts. Um, I like to use Barack Obama as the perfect example of this and, and you know whether regardless of your pol political affiliation and whether you like o Barack Obama or not, to me he is an amazing um, example of a grassroots viral fundraiser. He financed his campaign on average with five dollar donations, um, but he just got so creative with his um, cell phone donations, online donations, viral campaigns that all these very small amounts just added up over and over again and he raised amounts for his campaign that were amazing. Um, and so you can do the same thing for your organization. Use the internet um, to reach more people. It is a very low cost, if not no cost, um, way of generating donations. A lot of your other types of traditional fundraising have expense associated with them that you may not have on hand. Even if the return on that expense ends up being a good amount of revenue for your organization, if you don't have the money you need to initially initiate that fundraising campaign, um, then it's not going to do you any good. And so internet fundraising is becoming very popular now. There's so many ways out there through the internet, through um, Facebook, through PayPal, through direct links from your website, um, the toolbars that give a penny for every search somebody does if they've got your toolbar installed. There's so many creative ways to generate um, small gifts through the internet now uh, that it's definitely something all organizations want to take advantage of. 
and then you'll want to be patient. Um, don't stop moving forward just because money's tight and times are tough. You may have to slow down a little bit um, and focus more on the low-cost fundraising initiatives like the internet uh, fundraising and maybe step back from the idea of doing a huge direct mail campaign this year because you don't have the funding available. Um, but don't just bury your head in the ground and give up. You want to keep going, slow down, readjust, and get creative. And then it's very important um, to plan. Plan, plan, plan. Organizations should have goals for the amount of money they need to raise and what the money will be used for. Um, it's not enough to say, you know, we're going to feed the homeless and we need money to feed the homeless. You really need a detailed plan on the exact amount of money you need because X amount of dollars it takes for each meal and your goal is to serve you know, a thousand people this meal, and so you do the math and you figure out how much you need, what it's going to cost to raise that, and you develop a detailed plan um, that will outline all the minor and major details of, of the fundraising event or campaign. And so that perfectly segues us into information on developing your fundraising plan. Um, uh, Nice quote here from Yogi Berra, uh, you got to be careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. Um, you really need to have a well-developed written fundraising plan um, step by step for the year so that you know where you're going. Without a plan, you may have every person in your organization doing a different thing, heading in a different direction, and so nothing will ever come together and produce results. So getting started with a fundraising plan, uh, many of you are probably in the early stages of your organization's life cycle, and so you're just wanting to learn the basic steps involved in developing a fundraising plan for a newly formed nonprofit. And so to try and break it down to the bare bones, um, there's basically six steps that can lead to a, a nice, solid fundraising plan. First, um, you have to develop a realistic budget. You need to write down the plan, estimate how much your fundraising program is going to cost, create a timeline for implementing the plan, identify the specific funding sources that you're going to target, and then have an evaluation plan in place to evaluate the results. You have to start by developing a realistic budget. Um, many times I feel that when I'm working with clients who are budgeting for the organization, especially when they're founders, it's a new organization, they're really passionate and excited and and motivated to make a change in the community and do great things, I think that sometimes they tend to get a little overzealous and I have to kind of play reality check police and, and bring them back down and say, okay, let's look at what we can realistically accomplish this year. Um, year one budget should not be $25 million. You're not going to build um, an entire community facility in the first year of your organization, um, it's just not realistic. While that may be possible, in 99% of the cases, it's not going to happen. So you really need to be realistic and develop goals uh, for the amount of money you need to raise that you feel are achievable. And then have a plan for what the money is specifically going to be used for. Are you going to use this money for overhead expenses? Um, to fund an ongoing program or develop a new program for the organization? Do you need a new facility um, and therefore need a capital campaign? Are you attempting to develop an emergency fund um, to have a safety net in place for when budget pitfalls occur? Um, or are you trying to close a deficit that, that already exists in your budget? Um, it's very important not only for your own internal administration, 
but also it's very important to your donors, specifically your foundation grant makers, your corporate donors, your, your major individual donors, to know specifically what their money is going to be used for should they give it to you. So that should definitely be part of your plan is having a realistic line item budget where you can show someone, um, here's how I plan to spend the money should you provide it to me. Um, it's very important that it be achievable. That, that's the biggest thing is start small. If you do better than what you plan for, great. But if you plan too much and you fall short, then you may end up in a bad situation. So it's always better um, to be a little more modest with your budget um, than to be overzealous. Next, you want to write down the plan um, so that everybody in your organization is on the same page so that you know where you are in your timeline. Um, you have to develop a written plan that states how much you need to raise from what sources you plan to raise that funding and how you're going to go about implementing that plan. You'll first want to start with your current programs and current funding, um, looking at what expenses you currently have on your plate and evaluating um, is that amount of money being covered at this time or is there a gap? If there's a gap, you may have to develop an initial fundraising campaign to cover that gap. If all your current programs is being covered with the funding sources that you currently have in place, then maybe the fundraising plan that you're developing is to um, a, implement a new and innovative program that you don't currently offer or to expand on your facilities or hire additional professionals within the organization. Um, do you want to do more but lack the funds to do so? Having a written fundraising plan will give you the roadmap that you need to make it happen. Um, and this preliminary financial accounting will help you arrive at what your monetary goals should be for your fundraising. You really want to evaluate your current budget, the budget for your upcoming year, identify where you have overages or shortages, um, and then decide what exactly you're going to attempt to raise funds to cover. And once you know those things, then it's very easy to put the dollar amounts together and come up with, you know, an initial goal for the fundraising campaign. Once you have estimated the expenses that you need to cover, how much of a shortfall you may have in your budget, you need to begin to estimate what the cost of the actual fundraising campaign will be. And that's why it's important to have already identified the type of fundraising campaign or campaigns that you're going to implement throughout the year. Um, some fundraising initiatives are more costly um, with the percentage of every dollar um, than others, but they may ultimately turn out larger net proceeds for your organization. For example, um, special events like galas and dinners, they kind of have a high percentage cost of fundraising because there's a lot of things that you have to pay for. But at the end of the day, if you're having a $100, $200 ahead event, well, the percentage of every dollar that goes towards the cost of holding that event are high, that can still turn into big money for your organization. Most experts recommend um, that fundraising and overall administrative costs not exceed 20% of your overall budget. Um, that's becoming high. 20% is even becoming high for administrative expenses nowadays um, because funding is so competitive. Organizations are striving to reduce their administrative costs lower and lower. Your administrative costs are your fundraising expenses, your executive director's salary, um, your utilities, your marketing, your travel, things like that that aren't directly program expenses. Um, you want to keep the percentage of your budget that um, those 
funds incorporate as low as possible. So for example, you know, if you're using the 20% guideline and you have a $25,000 total annual budget, you don't want to allocate more than $5,000 for administrative and fundraising costs. Um, I am finding personally that especially when it comes to foundation grant making, that they are preferring much lower administrative fees or administrative costs than they have in the past. Um, many grant applications that I have personally prepared over recent months have had stipulations like if your annual administrative expenses are more than 8%, don't bother to apply. Um, so you definitely want to keep those costs as low as possible when you're evaluating what fundraising initiatives are the most appropriate for your organization. You want to keep that in mind. If you're a very, very large organization, then yeah, you can put some big money into hosting big special events, um, golf tournaments and galas and things like that that have high costs because those costs still represent a smaller percentage of your overall budget. But if you're a small organization, just getting started, um, you don't initially want to, in year one, hold a $10,000 gala if your whole budget's only $25,000 because then that's going to bump your administrative costs really high. And it's preferable that you would have held a lower scale fundraising event and been able to allocate more towards programming and actually fulfilling the mission that you were established to fulfill. Within your fundraising plan, it's very important to create a timeline. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. Uh, whatever works for you is best. Um, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Word, um, Publisher, they can create some great tables and spreadsheets that you can get together with your fundraising team and develop a nice um, aesthetic calendar that breaks things down by by quarter, or by month, by week, whatever works best for your organization. But you need to have a written timeline of when um, different goals or objectives will be achieved in your fundraising plan. Uh, so for example, you want to fill in a year's calendar with specific activities for the year and identify who's going to be the lead for each of those projects. Uh, whether you're holding a fundraising event once a year, twice a year, quarterly, um, your calendar should show um, you know, a start time for that fundraising campaign or event and an end time. Um, who's going to be responsible for what activities. Um, and that way everyone knows what their role is, what the plan is, and how much time left they have to, to meet certain milestones. Uh, go further by developing timelines for each fundraising activity. You may have an overall timeline for the year um, that delineates what events you're going to do in, in what month, when you're going to begin certain fundraising campaigns. But then for each one, they should have their own specific timeline. For example, your annual fundraising um, timeline may show that you know September is the best month to start a direct mail campaign. Um, but then you want to go further and, and establish a specific timeline for that direct mail campaign where you know on September 1st, we need to meet and identify the list of people we're going to mail to. And then the next week, we're going to put together the postcards that we're actually going to mail. And then have a specific timeline um, with measurable objectives for each step of that campaign. Same is true for you know, your online auctions, planned giving seminars, galas, and other special events. Each event that appears on your annual fundraising calendar should then be broken down into a timeline for that specific event, um, so you know who should be doing what and when. It's important to identify a variety of funding sources um, from which to solicit funding for your organization. The biggest thing with funding source identification is diversity. It is so important for your organization to have a very diversified fundraising plan. You don't want to rely solely on one special event every year to fund your organization's budget. You don't want to rely solely on grant to support your budget. The most successful organizations and the most attractive organizations to funders are those who have, have diversified fundraising plans so that when you present, for example, a proposal to a grant maker, you can show them, you know, this is how much we are 
planning to bring in from individual donors, from corporate giving programs, from uh, foundation grants, from our program service fees, from our annual event, from our direct mail campaign. Donors like to see that you are working all of your resources and utilizing every avenue you can to bring in money for the organization because they're really interested in sustainability. Um, donors, whether they be individuals or corporations or foundations or the government, they want to give to organizations that they feel are going to be sustain sustainable, that are continuing to fulfill their mission and do the good they're doing in their community um, this year and next year and on past our lifetime. Um, because there's nothing that seems worse than to give a big chunk of money to an organization that's going to fall apart next year and make it feel like your money really didn't flourish into anything. Um, want to make sure that you have identified all the possible audiences for your fundraising campaign. Talk to your board, your volunteers, your staff. Um, help to brainstorm and identify any personal resources that they may bring to the table so that you know um, you have addressed every possible resource that's available to you. Um, so you'll want to consider government and foundation grants, special events, product sales or other ways of achieving earned income, being careful not to generate unrelated business income, um, and soliciting funds online. There's so many different and creative ways that people are generating funding for their organizations now. Um, and so it's important just to brainstorm, remain diversified, um, and plan for a variety of different ways of bringing in funding for the organization. And then evaluation should always be a integral portion of your fundraising plan. Um, to evaluate the effectiveness of your fundraising program, you're going to want to regularly look back and identify strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities in all areas. Um, in your planning, your board of directors, your volunteers, staff, uh, researching new donors, new fundraising support systems and technologies, um, ongoing PR for your organization is all part of donor cultivation. But you don't want to wait until the end of the year to look back and evaluate whether or not your fundraising plan was effective. You want to implement evaluation throughout your plan um, at different checkpoints along the way, whether it be monthly or quarterly, whatever works for you know the volume of your fundraising plan. You want to make sure that if something's not working, you can identify easily and early on that it's not working and reevaluate your methodology and maybe change directions and, and steer gears in a different way. Um, you don't want to wait until the end of the year and have no money and be like, oh, well, nothing works. We have no money. Um, you want to realize that early on and be able to change direction. Now we'll talk a little about some, some fun and easy fundraising ideas um, that you may want to consider for your organization. First is, is the old-fashioned direct mail campaign. But there's different ways to get creative with direct mail. Everybody gets the um, March of Dimes mailing in the mail. You get the American Lung Association I get every year. The Red Cross sends out mailings you know, requesting um, donations. Something that I think initially was a very creative idea for nonprofits, and then it kind of caught on um, with many nonprofits, and everybody kind of started doing it, and so it became not so special anymore. Was the address labels? Um, perhaps you have gotten them in the mail, where an organization sends you um, a book of of address return address labels with a pretty picture, or a logo, or a character on them, and your name and address already printed. Um, for you to use as your return address label, and they're asking for a donation. Um, the idea, I think, is that you feel like, wow, they went to the, the trouble and the expense of having these address labels created personally for me. I should really send them a, a donation. And that was a creative idea. But a lot of organizations picked up on it, and now I get a lot of those. Um, another creative idea is a congratulations postcard um, send out for direct mail. 
you can reach out to recent college and high school graduates that have just received their graduation gifts, typically money, um, and you know, congratulate them on their recent achievement and provide them with a little information on what you do and why this would be a good opportunity for them to give back to the community um, through a gift to your organization. It's an opportunity to not only ask for a donation, but also to identify potential volunteers. Um, many high school and college age students um, participate in volunteer work. That's really one of the largest age groups for community service. And a lot of um, degree programs are now requiring a certain amount of community service involvement um, in order to meet the qualifications for their degree. So it's a good opportunity to reach out to this target demographic, um, request donations, request volunteer services, um, be creative, get them involved, ask them to send you a video of themselves doing something for the community, have a contest on your website. Um, you just want to get creative. Direct mail is sometimes a more costly uh, fundraising event. Um, now, the cost can vary depending on the size of the list you're going to be sending to and whether or not you're a 501c3 that has um, applied with the Postal Service for nonprofit rate mail. The cost will vary, but overall, direct mail is, is a higher cost fundraising option because you have the cost involved with the printing and the shipping. Um, and the percentage-wise, the number of individuals that are going to respond with a donation to those requests is going to be low, but um, in order to increase your return on investment with this type of fundraising campaign, you really want to think of creative ways to reach out. So don't just send the old-fashioned postcard, please support us, check the box if you want to give $25, $50, or $100 and mail it back in with the credit card number. That's boring. People don't respond to that. Uh, get creative. Send them something that's going to catch their eye with some innovative tactic. Um, utilize all your human resources in the organization, your board, your volunteers to brainstorm and get creative ideas together on ways to reach out and generate additional funding through direct mail. Um, some of the benefits of a direct mail campaign include um, the possibility of generating two to ten times its cost. Um, Tips on saving money with this, as I said, you know, use postcards instead of envelopes and letters. Try and get your printing donated in kind. Utilize your bulk rate postage. Um, and keep your mailing list up to date because there's no sense in wasting money sending out um, mail to invalid addresses. Another event that you may want to consider is a cook-off. A lot of times there's chili cook-offs and spaghetti cook-offs. These can be low-cost events that can be a lot of fun and involve a lot of members of the community um, so that you can sell your cause and also market your organization at the same time. Um, you can sell tickets to the public. You can utilize social media as a no-cost form of marketing of these events. Um, develop a presence for your organization on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, and constantly promote the events that you have going on, um, keep people interested. I know personally on my Facebook page, outside of my friends and family, I have nonprofit organizations that I'm interested in um, and their fan pages on my Facebook so that I can keep up with what they have going on, their new programs I may be interested in, the events they're having in the community. I find that I get a, invited to a lot of fun fundraising events. Um, and then it makes people feel like they're not just giving their money away, they're really getting an experience for this donation. Um, costs can be reduced on these events by asking for in-kind donations from local grocery stores, whether it be products or gift cards to get the materials that you need, um, and sending a press release to the local media and hoping that some of your local news outlets will pick up on it and put it on the news or on the radio so that you can really generate larger audiences to these events. When it comes to special events, um, prep time can be anywhere from one to six months depending upon um, the extent and complexity of the event. And some of the benefits here in, is the involvement of the local community, 
Um, if you hold it as a cause marketing event, you may find new donors um, through competing restaurants. For example, a lot of restaurants have a you know XYZ charity night where um, a percentage of the sales that night all get donated to the charity, and so they have the charity out there marketing that, um, and it's kind of a win-win, and that's what cause marketing is all about is kind of a win-win between a for-profit and a non-profit. The nonprofit goes out and they spread the word about their charity night at the restaurant, and they win because they get to fill the place up, um, and then they get a percentage of the proceeds. So the more people they get in the door, the more money comes into their organization. At the same time, the for-profit wins because they have a full restaurant that night. And so you have to find ways to collaborate and work together um, to cause market for your organization. You can reach hundreds of people if you promote effectively and make a lot of money on your ticket sales, contest entries, raffles, solicitation. Another thing that you may consider um, is product sales. There's tons of fundraising commercial co-venturers out there, companies that offer products that you can sell um, to raise money. Hershey's chocolates, you know, everybody's kid in school is sold gift wrap and, and all those kind of things to raise funds. And there's companies out there whose products specifically are targeted as fundraising products. Um, but again, you want to get creative with these as well because, like I said, everybody has sold chocolate, everybody has sold gift wrap. Um, sell a product that's different. Try and relate it to your organization's mission. Um, and an example might be a Christmas ornament sale. You know, sell a cause-related Christmas ornament during the holiday season. Um, you know, the pink ribbon for breast cancer, you see all kinds of things being sold. Um, I think I have socks that have them on it and cookware in my kitchen. Um, and a portion of the sales will go to the organization, and a portion will obviously cover the cost of you acquiring what you're selling. You want to, you know, get everyone involved. If you're a youth organization, get children involved with creating your own ornaments um, and selling those as a fundraising event um, offer to wrap the item as a gift for others um, and present it to them as uh, somebody affected by your cause. It's a good thing that you can offer this and say, hey, give this as a gift to somebody and we'll send along with it a note that says, you know, so-and-so made a donation to us in honor of you and here's your gift. Um, you just want to get creative and, and try and be out of the box when it comes to product sales. Now you don't want to go too far out of the box that you get yourself into commercial activity and get in trouble with those kind of things. Um, some tips for a successful product sale is to be sure the product is compatible with your organization's mission. You do not want to be selling something completely unrelated um, to what you're doing. Choose your product well. Make sure it's high quality um, and that the return on investment for the product you're considering is good. Um, and that means how much money over the cost of the item that you can sell it for that will come back into your organization as um, profit or additional donation. The Internet is an amazing resource nowadays for fundraising for nonprofits. There are so many websites out there that allow you to raise money for your organization. Um, definitely every nonprofit organization should have a web presence um, in today's society. If you are out in the community spreading the word about your cause, you interest someone and they want to find out more information, they're going to Google you. you. So you definitely want to have a web presence and you want to get involved in all the social media because they open up so much opportunity for um, a viral effect and reaching out to an online audience. And by a viral effect that means, you know, you, you get me interested, and because I'm interested, I invite my friends because I think they should be interested, and they invite their friends, and before you know it, the word of your organization is spreading all across the Internet without you having to devote time and effort into that marketing. Um, so invite your friends and network to join and support your cause. Facebook causes and Facebook fan pages are great. You can actually generate donations right through Facebook. Um, you can ask your donors to share something on your wall related to cause um, to, to get your constituents emotionally tied to what your organization is doing. You can add videos and pictures of past fundraising events, of the clients you've helped, 
um, so many ways that you can utilize the internet to share upcoming events um, and to really continue to cultivate your donors to keep your constituents involved, interested, and basically um, you know, touched by what your organization is doing. And by utilizing the internet, it's very low cost in comparison with you know, traditional fundraising campaigns. And it has the potential to reach thousands and thousands of people. Um, some tips for that is don't forget to use email marketing to let everyone know about your initiative, especially if you have a Facebook initiative. Um, you want to send that out to everybody on your email list so that everyone's aware. They all join by them joining their friends, see that they join, then they might join. You really want to get the word out so that it becomes viral and spreads. Um, use your website to direct traffic to your cause page. Um, from your organization's main website, you uh, want to let your constituents know that you have a presence on Facebook, on Twitter, on um, whatever other social media sites that you're involved in. Have a link from your website so that they can get into those pages because it's a lot easier to spread the word through viral marketing with social media nowadays than it is to drive traffic to one specific website. Um, to generate interest through your website, you have to get each and every individual to find out about your website and go there. Um, utilizing social media like Facebook, you have the ability to post to you know, dozens, hundreds, thousands of people all at one time, um, and then they have that appear right on their page, and therefore, their friends see it too, and so it's, it's a lot easier to spread the word through social networking than it is through one individual website. So you want to make sure that your website directs traffic to your cause pages. You want to make sure that your organization has a presence within GuideStar. Um, if you're not familiar with GuideStar, GuideStar.org is a great website where you can find a lot of information on public charities in the United States. You can search by organization name, by EIN number, state, um, and they really do uh, publish a lot of financial statements, 990 returns, list of board members, um, and so you want to make sure your organization has a presence on GuideStar. If you're filing 990s with the IRS, most likely you're there because GuideStar does pull PDF copies of all the 990s filed by public charities and makes them available on their website. Um, but if you're not there because you don't file a full 990 um, or you haven't filed one yet, then you want to make sure that you become involved. And engage your audience. And don't forget to say thank you always. Um, and the Internet is another easy and low-cost way to do that. Um, it's a lot cheaper, cheaper to send out email thank you cards to your donors than it is to actually print and mail. I also want to briefly touch on the role of the board in fundraising. Um, I'm a firm believer in fully contributing boards. That is something that every nonprofit should have. All the members of your board should also be a donor to your organization. And that's not to say that every board member has to give huge amounts. Every board member should be giving what at whatever level is feasible for them. Um, but you kind of have to look at it like the board is the ultimate representatives of your organization. They're the insurer of the public's trust. And how um, could somebody come to me and ask me to give to an organization if those who are in place to stand for the organization won't give? Um, if you don't believe enough in, the own, in your own organization to contribute financially to it, how can you look me in the eye and ask me to? Um, it's also becoming a very common question that I'm seeing uh, from donors and from foundation grant makers nowadays is, you know, what percentage of your board is contributing and what percentage of your entire organization's budget represents board contributions. Um, so it's important that every member of the board know that not only are they expected to be a donor to the organization to whatever extent is feasible for them, um, but also that they are a member of the fundraising team, always. Um, board members should talk up their organization through all their professional lives, networking events, community events, 
um, reach out to their other resources that they may have in the community um, and always be a champion for the organization and always doing their best to raise money. So we'll basically summarize. Um, fundraising is critical to all organization success. Um, it should be planned and goal focused. The fundraising team needs to be trained well, challenged, motivated, and rewarded for outstanding performance. Um, fundraising needs to start small and then build revenue. You're not going to do a million dollar capital campaign as your first fundraising event, um, but something you, you may be able to do as a car wash or a spaghetti dinner, um, generate a couple thousand dollars that you can then in turn invest into a larger scale event or grant writing campaign that can bring in um, some much more needed funds for the organization. And then fundraising is an ongoing process um, to be supplemented by grants and service fees. So like I said, you want your plan to be diversified, that you have a variety of fundraising events planned throughout the year, um, and that those are supplemented by you know, your grants from the government or from foundations, and any fees that you may charge for your programs. All right, well, that is going to conclude the presentation portion of today's webinar. Uh, thank you, Melanie. I, I know I learned something, so I'm sure that everyone else out there did. Um, I'm just going to touch on a few things really quick, uh, let Melanie take a quick breather before she jumps in and starts answering uh, some of the many questions that we've already received. Um, you know, one of the most common questions is, what are the next steps? Well, Melanie did mention it in the previous slide, but you need to start with simple fundraisers. Um, and, you know, we've been working with nonprofits for a long time now, and therefore we've put together a great fundraising toolkit. Uh, it's, I believe it's over 40 pages of really good information, step-by-step -step, uh, processes and action plans on forming your fundraising team um, and actually organizing the events. Now this, is, this also comes in a printed and bound uh, binder, and it includes a CD with uh, customizable templates on for a variety of different fundraising events. Um, and today, just you know, for attending our seminar, we would like to offer 10% off of that. So it's only $135 if that's something you're interested in. Please don't hesitate on contacting myself, Melanie, or our general line, and we can definitely help you out with that. Uh, some of the next steps also you want to take are attending a few more webinars, you know, learning about grant writing and strategic planning, um, ways to avoid the top reasons that nonprofits fail. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we do have a few upcoming events. Uh, now you can register and read more and learn more about these events at charitynetusa.com forward slash webinar forward slash May. And uh, you can sign up, like I said, and register at the same time. Also, um, a special promotion that just started yesterday um, in honor of our veterans and active military for Memorial Day. Uh, we have kind of a sliding sale going on right now where you spend $100 to $399. You'll get 10% off your entire order. If you spend $400 to $699, you'll get 15% off. And if you spend $700 or more, you'll get a big 20% off. Now, some of those services that you can get those discounts on is our 501c3 services, grant writing, strategic planning, website development, graphic design, marketing, uh, bookkeeping and accounting. And as we've already stated, the fundraising kit is already at a 10% discount for you. And finally, if you have any questions following the webinar, you know, a lot of the times people leave and they have so much information flowing through their head that they, they even forget just the questions that they wanted to ask. Um, don't hesitate to contact myself or Melanie and, you know, shoot us an email, give us a call, and we'll definitely get a question, uh, get your question answered for you. Also, go ahead and find us on Facebook or a bit, or a fan, I'm sorry, Facebook or Twitter, and you'll be able to find a lot of uh, great information, tips, uh, blog posts, article postings, um, special promotions and discounts. Uh, just, you know, follow us and we'll keep you up to date on kind of the latest happenings. So now we're going to go ahead and take a few questions. We are really tight on time today, seeing as it was a very extensive webinar. 
Uh, but we will get some questions in, and if we don't get to your question live, we will follow up with you uh, via email or phone after the webinar. All right, so to get started, the first question we have is how do you do fundraising if you are just starting the nonprofit and it is in an idea phase? Well, if you're just putting together the idea for the organization, then you're really not in a position to begin a fundraising campaign yet. But at that point, you really don't have any expenses to cover with fundraising if you're just putting together the idea. Something to keep in mind is that in most states, 40 out of the 50 states, your organization does need to be established as a nonprofit and registered in most cases with the Attorney General's Office um, under charitable organization registration laws to be able to fundraise. So you have to make sure you're in compliance with those things before you begin. Um, but you don't need to have everything fully developed to begin your fundraising plan. You just need to have the organization's initial steps taken to actually legally form um, and and have an actual organization that you're raising funds for rather than just an idea. Um, I have another question. Is selling products an income or a donation? Um, well, selling products is income. Donations are income. But maybe what you mean is when you sell a product, is it considered a donation? And that's no. Um, if a donor receive something in return for the money that they give to your organization, then it's not a donation and it's not tax deductible unless they give you in excess of its value. Um, for example, if you're selling something that's worth 10 bucks and they give you 20, they can write off the excess 10 as a donation. Otherwise, um, it's just a, a regular transaction. Now, Income from product sales is still tax exempt for you as long as it's directly related to your exempt purpose. Um, you couldn't go out and start to sell real estate or something like that that's totally commercial because you'd face taxation. But just to have fundraising campaigns where you're selling a product to generate money for your organization, um, that income is tax exempt for you but not deductible to the donor. Um, is funding the startup cost refundable or just considered a donation? Well, that really depends on how you do it. Um, it is totally okay for the startup costs involved in your organization to be refundable to you. You just need to have a formal agreement in place for that. And it doesn't have to be anything extensive. Um, but if, for example, you're going to put out $1,000 out of your pocket to cover the you know, preparation and filing fees for your initial documents. And you just should have a little agreement written um, between you and the remaining members of the board representing the organization that states that, you know, once funding is available, the organization will repay you for that money. Um, if you choose not to do that, if you just put the money in and have no agreement in place to have it paid back, then it would be considered a donation. And once the organization gets a 501c3, you could take a tax write-off on your personal taxes for what you put into it. Okay, I think this is the last question I have time for. Um, I have heard mixed opinions about what type of fundraising is best. I spoke with a nonprofit founder and he said that when he first started, grants were his most successful source. However, um, in reading a book, it insists that grant writing is not a good way to go for startups. Do you have any insight on this? Um, or does it simply vary depending on what type of organization you are? I think that grants are always a good source of income for a nonprofit. Um, I, but for a startup, your success at grants will really depend on how well planned you are. Um, if you're an initial startup organization, you just got your 501c3, you don't really have your programs very planned, you have no other sources of fundraising um, going on, you're not attractive to a grant maker. But there are grant makers out there who specifically offer seed funding for new organizations, but they want to fund those that are well planned and have innovative programs, um, specifically those that are addressing the need in a unique way. Um, there might be uh, 
d dozens of organizations that are addressing the same cause as you, but if you have come up with a new and innovative way for addressing that issue, that's really attractive to a foundation grant maker, and even though you're a startup, that would be an attractive project for them to fund. All right. Well, thank you, Melanie, so much. Um, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today for questions. Um, like I have already stated, though, if we did not get to your question, we do apologize. Um, but we will contact you via email or phone to make sure you get an answer to your question. Once again, if you need to contact us, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to email us or give us a phone call. Um, Thank you again for attending today's webinar, and we hope to see you at future events. Have a great Thursday.